meaning also a young woman. Some say before she's married, others say of marriageable age. That's fine if you want to look at the semantic range, but it doesn't do a thing for helping to understand the sign of this passage. And number two, even the Jews previous to that did not see Alma as a young woman. They could have written that down, but they didn't. They too translated with the Greek Parthenon, which means virgin. It means virgin. And so when you and I look at this passage, we have to understand two things. There is a portion of that dealing with the time factor that belonged to the house of David in that time. There's also a, another portion of that dealing with the house of David that had a, a future fulfillment and could only be fulfilled and only was fulfilled in Jesus because there were no virgin births at the time that this occurred at the time of the prophecy. That happened later. And Matthew points, note this carefully, Matthew points to the virgin birth concept and nothing to do with the time. Why? The time has already been taken care of. All right. Excellent stuff there. All right. We will um, follow that up with the question here dealing with Terrence's lesson. What kind of things would help us and or hinder us uh, in applying sound hermeneutics? Oh, yeah, I'll leave that right here. Put that one over there. Put this one right here. Appreciate that. One thing we'll say up front is what uh, Chad has presented, certainly, and now, what Brother Stephen has presented, have, have answered that question in part already. Um, the notes that, that I've got, of course, that was going to be one of the points that I dealt with. But um, you got a couple of sources that I would definitely recommend. I mentioned the D.R. Dungan, and of course, that's a, a work that stood the test of time, in, in my opinion, and probably in most of yours as well. I think it was completed in 1880, or published in 1888. Again, still, it's a hermeneutical textbook that is utilized far and wide, and he's got a section, as we mentioned before, on things that would help with the sound hermeneutic or sound exegesis and things that would hinder sound exegesis. And just some of the things that he mentions there, as far as some helps are concerned, the very first thing on his list is common sense. And you just think about the fact that, and what he means to say, I think there is, is you know, logic, logic, being able to engage in sound reason, and Chad talked about that a little bit a moment ago, of course, we know God's got a reason. Uh, we quote most often Isaiah chapter 1, verse eight, number 18, when the uh, Jew Jews or the uh, Hebrews of Judea were involved in Canaanite idolatry. You know, God sends the prophet Isaiah and is like, hey, let's reason this thing out. Let's, let's come let us reason together. God has got a logic, got a reason. Uh, Brother Adnip mentioned in the hermeneutic of Jesus how many times, man, he appealed to sound reasoning to be able to convey the thoughts and to get these people right uh, that he was continuing with where the hermeneutical process was off. And so common sense, logic is one of the things that he mentions. Um, a lot of these guys, these textbooks, Walter Kaiser, Moises Silva, J.D. Thomas, lots of uh, guys that are... are experts so-called in, in hermeneutic, hermeneutics and hermeneutic process will mention uh, these things and how that whenever we go to the Bible, it's essential that we approach the Bible like we approach any other book and like we approach our typical conversation. There are all types of factors that we have to consider. What kind of language is Chad utilizing when he's communicating with me? Is he using a figurative language? Is he using uh, literal language? If Chad tells me, hey, man, you know, let's run down to Fred's and get a bite to eat, I know he doesn't mean let's literally take off jogging. Well, at least I hope he doesn't mean that. I'm not going to engage in that with him. I'm going to take the, he means let's get in a vehicle and figuratively run down to Fred's. And so those things have to be taken in, in consideration. And, and one of these things that these guys mention in these textbooks is this, and we agree with this wholeheartedly, is it is a infraction of monumental uh, proportions whenever we want to utilize the Bible in a much different way than we utilize typical conversation. God is using conversation. 
dialogue and words to speak to us, and so why would we utilize the Bible in any other, any other way? We talked about the mental industry, obviously, dealing with making sure we're willing to put forth the effort that's necessary. Duncan also mentions moral purity, and I love that particular point. He mentions moral purity, and here's something that all of us probably in here will be able to relate to is how many times is someone's ability to properly interpret a text of scripture obscured because of a immoral situation that either he finds himself in or finds one of his close companions or family members in. And probably one of the things that is most readily uh, available to our, uh, our, our reminiscence is things like uh, divorce, remarriage, false doctrines that have been prevalent in our brotherhood for so very, very long. And I've known the people, and you have as well, that have taught hermeneutically accurately what the Bible teaches on these subject matters in places like Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But as soon as someone in their family has gotten themselves involved in an unscriptural divorce and remarriage, now all of a sudden we want to change the word of God. And so he mentions that good moral purity. If, I'm, if I've got an affinity for drinking, then I'm going to, going to abuse John chapter 2 <laughs> whenever it comes to what Jesus Christ did during that first miracle. Um, we got to make sure that we understand those things. And so moral purity is going to help us. If we go to the Bible, like Chad mentioned, without any biases, perhaps biases that exist because of a situation that we find ourselves in or someone else does, it's going to do us uh, good uh, and, and correctly inter interpreting God's word. He misses spiritual integrity, going to God's word, and a lot of these concepts cross with what these guys have already said. But spiritual integrity, I want to go to the Bible for the purpose of which it's intended, and that is with us. The message that the Holy Spirit has put there. And so a lot of people go to the Bible for many other reasons. Some of these these hermeneutical guys that we mentioned, most of them mention things like pretexting, uh, presuppositions, which crosses lines with some of the things that have been said already. Presupposition, Walter Kaiser and most of his writings on hermeneutics deals with the idea of presupposition. Now, it doesn't always follow his own principles. He's got a, an article called Counting Caricatures on his website, and I'm not even sure not, but uh, I know he's up in age. But he's got a website, and he's Calls it counting caricatures, this article where he, man, tries to defend women leadership in the church, and he's got an affinity for women leadership. One of his other books towards an ex exegetical theology, he also takes time in there to try to defend his affinity for women leadership in the church. But he begins that article by talking about the fact that we need to set, lay aside our presuppositions, and we all have them. Like these guys have already mentioned, we all have them by virtue of the fact that sometimes we learn things before we're able to even conceptualize them intellectually. You know, our babies, they learn that we're to put money in the collection plate when it passes by. They learn that we're to partake of the, the fruit of the vine and unleavened bread before they ever know or are able to understand conceptually or intellectually why those things are done. Eventually, they will have to study to develop true concern, but everybody's got presuppositions, and he says a challenge in going to the Word is removing those. Uh, unfortunately, he fails to do that himself in some of his uh, theology. And then, of course, an accurate translation. Now, so we definitely want to make sure in the, that, that we have a translation that is accurate. There are some uh, that are worth a lot more than others, that's for sure. And so those are some of the things that he mentions that are help, some of the things that are, are obstacles uh, you know, to, to a sound hermeneutic. Uh, we want to look at, we've already mentioned, proof texting. I go to the text with the idea of wanting simply to see if the text is going to prove what I already believe. So I've already got my belief fixed. I just want to go to the Bible and I want to find a text that's just going to prove that. And like somebody mentioned this moment, I think it was Brian, the Bible can be used to prove anything we want to, want to, want to prove if that's how we're going to utilize it uh, through the process of unsound hermeneutics. And so that uh, something that I, I have experienced or witnessed over the years you have as well 
is a love of denominationalism. We've got some of our brethren who have fallen in love with denominationalism, and that has certainly marred their ability to rightly divide God's word because of them trying to be like the postmodernism is a paradigm, a phenomenon that the readers ugly head. I mean, early, there's, you, know, you can't put your finger on one particular date, but certainly in the 60s, uh, it, it began to uh, really have uh, carry some weight, especially in our American society. But when you look at that idea, you know, some of the, the tenets of postmodernism is there is no such thing as absolute truth. There is no objective standard. And, and whenever you look at some of the proponents of things like that, you have men like Hans George Gadamer, uh, which was a German theologian. You have a Paul Ricoeur philosopher from France, and they offered up works in which they promoted the idea, and I'm paraphrasing or summarizing the idea that when it comes to the Bible, you really don't have to, you really can't ascertain what the meaning is, nor do you even need to. The only thing that's really important is what it means to you. And so many in denominationalism have gravitated toward that type of hermeneutic, and we've even got brethren who have fallen in love with that type of hermeneutic, and, and if that's what I believe, then that's going to rupture my ability to do what Paul commanded Timothy to do, and that is to rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, the Bible, again, has a meaning that God has put there, and it's not simply for us to go to it and see, well, what I think this thing means to me, or what it means to Chad, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean the same thing for either one of us. And despite what I believe, as you've already mentioned, the truth is truth, right? and, it's, and it's not uh, dependent upon what I believe or Brian or anybody else. So. One final question here that uh, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly here, but it says, does Jesus refer to the scope of the Old Testament scriptures that he accepted? And so I'm not sure what's meant by scope there. If he's talking about the time frame from Genesis to Malachi, uh, which I would say yes, uh, or if he's talking about the scope of patriarchy versus mosaic. But of course we know that he was Galatians 4.4 in the fullness of time. Uh, God brought, brought forth his son, made a woman, made under the law, that he, he, was, he lived under the law of Moses, and he kept the law uh, perfectly. Of course, some of it didn't apply to him because he was without sin, uh, and, so, uh, and he lived and died under that old law. Hebrews 9, 16, and 17, the new covenant did not go into effect until a after his death, uh, and so I don't know if that's what's meant by that, but if someone, one of our panel, has light on that, please come forth, and I'll leave the question right there. Well, we have to get you a mic, but anyway. <laughs> Jesus spoke of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Um, and I'm supposing uh, that that's what this question refers to. For the Jews, the first five, okay, if, if you go back and find a Jewish book, Jews don't See, because the New Testament says that when he said in old, he made the, uh, I mean, a new covenant, he made the first old. Well, they don't believe there's been a new covenant. So that's not the terminology that they use. The terminology that they use is Tanakh. It's, and since the Hebrew has no uh, vowels in it, it has strictly a, uh, um, what do you say, this, uh, uh, the consonants. What, what happens is, just take the three letters, T, N, and, 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 and K, and the first T is Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And then the next comes from Navi, the prophets, which, by the way, moves beyond just uh, Isaiah through Malachi. It moves also into books such as First and Second Chronicles, etc. And then you also have what were called the Kitab, which is the, the writings, which would be like the Psalms, etc. So when you see Jesus making reference to those three things, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, when you hear him mention those three things in the scriptures, he is doing exactly what the Jews do today when they take the Tanakh. Now, does the Tanakh carry or have any other books in it 
that, that our present Old Testament um, doesn't have. In other words, it, is it less or is it more? It's identical to our Old Testament today, minus the Catholic Apocrypha. By the way, Brother Brian spoke of apocryphal books in the New Testament, but none of them were ever included in any canonized system um, that has passed. Uh, let me just in, in what you said. The, the first King James Version translation that came out in 1611 had also the apocryphal books there, but they were not set within as being what we would call canonical. They were set there, as was stated, and you read, and, and, you, and you pointed out, this might be some historical uh, helps for you. So we have to go back and read why people did what they did. But in saying psalms, hymns, I mean psalms and hymns, in saying the, the law, the prophets, and the psalms, what you have being said there is Tanakh, which is exactly all the Old Testament scriptures that we have today, exactly as... Um, they had them then. Does that answer the question of the scope of the? Yes, sir. Yes, and theirs would have been written differently. You're, it would have been set in differently. To the blood of Zacharias actually ends uh, the, the, the Katav. Yes. In this passage, he, he mentions those, but they go, it also includes between them what you would call the uh, Psalms. I'm sorry. Yeah, can you come on up and, and, and do that? Uh, we can actually, uh, these guys can do a Deutero Mico <laughs> and not get the feedback, but anyway. But I guess you guys can just swap back and forth. Well, just to make an observation, uh, so the, the so-called Tanakh, uh, the uh, collection of the Hebrew, of the Hebrew uh, books, in the first century, Jesus in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, refers to the, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Probably Psalms there is a synecdoche. Right? That would be uh, for the, uh, the rest of the, uh, what we would call the, the wisdom literature. But, uh, so, but the collection, the order of collection of the um, Hebrews in the first century of the Hebrew scriptures began with Genesis and ended with Second Chronicles. So take a look at Matthew uh, 23. Here we have Jesus saying um, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, this is Jesus speaking, from the blood of righteous Abel. So where is the blood of Abel documented? What book? Genesis to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah. Now, we can talk more about some of the names here, but where is that documented in the Old Testament collection? Second Chronicles. So here we have the extremities. Jesus is conceiving of the extremities of the Old Testament collection. So uh, Luke 24, 44, but also I would appeal to Luke, to Matthew chapter 23, where you can see Jesus himself identifying the extremities of the Old Testament collection. The scope. That, by the way, when you see the differences in those and the way that they are arranged in the Tanakh, whenever you see that, um, that's puzzling because of that way. So it puzzles us to do that. But those, all three of those concepts uh, point to this scope. Thank you very much, by the way. That. Any any others? <laughs> no, that's it. Yeah. All right, so that's good. Uh, and of course, if the question were said, 
Matthew 23, whatever, then, then, we, then I would have caught the scope of that. Oh, I got another one, Steve. No, just kidding. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No. All right, we appreciate that. That was a good question and answer session. We appreciate the questions and uh, great stuff, good study. And uh, we can just learn some great things here. We appreciate these brothers, both from this morning's lessons and this afternoon, for uh, contributing to the answer to these questions. And uh, it's great stuff, and we just like to promote Bible study around here. And this is one good way of doing it, and so we appreciate that. As we mentioned, uh, just a little change in the schedule for tonight. Instead of our 6.30 singing, and if you do have the program, uh, it's at, listed at 6.15 for tonight because we're going to have the 30 minutes of congregational singing, and then that will end at 6.45, and then I'm going to give a little presentation of where we are in the school right now so far as progress has been made to the building and students and all that. And so uh, I'll have about 15 minutes for that right before 7.00. Usually we do this kind of thing during the appreciation dinner, but because of the COVID situation, we're not going to have the appreciation dinner this year. Hopefully we can resume that again next year. I was really thankful we got the lectureship in last January, a bit here and there about some virus coming over from China, I think, but I'm not sure about that back then. Uh, but then it hit in March and everything started closing down. I thought, well, surely by next lectureship, everything will be cleared up and cool. Uh, it's not cleared up. It's not cool according to some, but we went ahead and had the lectureship anyway and appreciate those who have come in person, those who have chimed in online. And so hopefully by next lectureship, 2022, man, this thing will be out of our hair, but I don't know. You never know. But uh, we do appreciate and we, we, you know, as Lord willing, we'll have the lectureship next year, uh, beginning as it always has on the third Monday of January, which is Martin Luther King Jr. Day usually a holiday. But anyway, we will have that tonight at 645. I will just uh, have a little slide presentation. And then tonight's lessons, uh, as we mentioned, at 7 p.m. each night, you'll see Psalm 119, a certain aspect of that. And tonight will be Brother Larry Williams from the 201 Congregation in Bradenton, Florida. And his lesson will be Wisdom for Life's Direction. That is, some of the passages within Psalm 119 uh, talk about the direction to take in life. And so Larry's going to bring that out for us. And then at 7.40 p.m., calming words from Philippians 4, 6 through 8, Brother Jimmy Clark. And as you see, the 7.40 lessons each night uh, take a particular New Testament passage that mentions the Word or God's Word in that. And uh, what that brings us last night was comforting words, tonight calming words, and you might say, well, those kind of relate, and yes, of course, they do relate. Cheerful words was actually last night, but tonight, um, calming words, Philippians chapter 4, 6 through 8, so we look forward to the book available. Uh, the book uh, is the same price it's been since the early 2000s. And this will likely be the last year. It'll be $16. Uh, we'll have to talk about that. Uh, school people will uh, over the next year. Uh, but do pick up the volume. It's very good. It does have a little glitch in it, about 77 pages or somebody else's lectureship. But we do have a supplemental book to go along with this that has the, the pages that are missing. Actually, the pages are there, but the material is missing. And so that was something that was done at the publisher end. But we do have the PDF, that's still good like it always is, and so we have that available to us. We will have downloadable, so I guess we're still doing DVDs, that those that request it, but we will have videos that you can have of the lectureship too, and the price listing is in here. And the price is, you know, we don't, we don't make any money off of these, we just try to break even, and that's why we have it $16 and so forth, but um, you, know, you do help us by buying the material, helping to defer when you buy the book, you help defer the expense of the book to produce it. And so that's why we have the price as we have them. All right, uh, also speaking of prices and deferring payments, uh, the lectureship is put on by us every year. This is our 46th annual lectureship that we have had. We've had a book since 1994, a hardcover book. There were some folder books, some ring bound books before that, kind of sporadically. But since 1994, we have produced a consistent hard bound book. Many of those are out of print now, and the only way to get those is through the PDF, the electronic version of our book, which contains all the books from 1994. Actually, I think we may have some of the previous ones that were folder books and such included in that. It also has the 
Harvester, which is our monthly publication, which usually has a teaching article in there, as well as news about the school. We have those. That started, I believe, in the um, 70s. We're on our 41st volume of that, volume 41. Each, each year is a volume, uh, but it's not a January to December year. It's an August, no, September through August year. But anyway, we have 41 of those. So if you go back 41 years, I'm not good at math. That's when that started. And actually, um, Rod Rutherford is the one that came up with the name Harvester. Uh, he was very involved in mission work. Yes, that was him, Rod Rutherford. And uh, he taught here for a little bit. Uh, and he's the one that started the Harvester, at least as the name Harvester and the newsletter. And so we appreciate that history as well. But anyway, all that's on the, on the electronic version of the PDF. And as I mentioned yesterday, as preachers, we know we prepare for a sermon. And it doesn't matter if it's five people that are in the assembly or 500 people in the assembly. And notice each day that number gets bigger because that's the preacher's count. But, um, you know, we, we put the same preparation in it as preachers to prepare that sermon and to deliver that sermon. And much the same way, the lectureship has a lot of preparation involved in that. And we put a lot of expenses up front. And uh, so we asked if you can help, possibly help to defer the cost of the lectureship, please do so. Uh, we do not pass out a hat per se, uh, but you can give your contributions to me or anyone from the school, Kathy at the desk or at the booth that we had the display in the fellowship room. Uh, she will take the contribution as well. Uh, also, um, this year, well, we've had it for a couple of years, but particularly electronically through our website, you can contribute uh, through PayPal or through a debit card through our website. And so please take advantage of that. Many, many who usually come to lectureship are not, and so that they're wa they are watching online. We've had several. I forgot to look today, but yesterday it was over 1,500 um, hits or whatever on our website uh, with the live lectures, and so we appreciate that. And so we do have opportunities to give to help defray the expenses. And again, we are definitely the epitome of a nonprofit. Is uh, you know we uh, we operate in the red. But by the grace of God, we got that covered. Well, well, I won't say it, not that simple. <laughs> by your contributions, we get that covered. And we would like to raise that. And we have uh, made appeals to the harvester and such that if there are congregations who are not contributing, uh, can you please contribute $100 a month? If there are individuals not contributing, can you please contribute $50 a month? If you're not already contributing, we know that there are some already contributing, especially in this audience here. Uh, and so, but, but we, we need your support uh, to operate. God has always provided, and so we don't doubt that, but he provides through his church. And the BC Carr used to say, and I'm sure it wasn't original with him, but the good news is there's plenty of money in the brotherhood to support the Florida School of Preaching and several other good works. Back in the hallway, we have some displays of other good works back there, but the brotherhood has plenty of money to support these things. The bad news is it's still in their pockets. And so if you can help us out with that, we'd much appreciate it. Now, we usually don't start giving the counts till like about Wednesday or Thursday, but these are unprecedented times. And really, I think it's kind of good news myself, uh, but we're only 4,000 in the hole right now. And uh, that's pretty good, uh, I think. But, you know, don't take that, me saying that's pretty good, as, as being, okay, I don't have to give, but please give. <laughs> um, Please give. Now, obviously, our travel expenses have been cut down a little bit this year because several, well, we have, um, oh, yeah. So we had, we had 10 lessons for sure that we had to substitute for, a possible 11, but that guy showed up today, so that's, that's, that's good. So we've only had to, so far, we've only had to substitute 10 lessons, okay? Uh, and that represents, I think, like five or six speakers. Um, some of them, three of the guys had two lessons apiece. Uh, and then, of course, one, one brother, Brother Brandon um, Baggett, he, uh, his wife had a baby yesterday or today. I responded, I congratulated him on Facebook, but I can't remember if that was last night or this morning because, you know, lectureship time, I don't know what day it is or what time it is, except I know it's dinner because I heard Wayne's stomach rumbling over there. <laughs> no. But anyway, um, so, but anyway, so we, we've had less travel expenses this year, but we still want to pay the guys for traveling, the, the ones that are here speaking. It's only right to give them lodging and, and pay their way here. We do like to give them a $100 stipend for every time they speak, uh, and that we just like to do because, you know, a, a laborer is worthy of his hire. 
In fact, that's one of the things that really impressed me about the School of Preaching in 1996 when I came to interview to work here. At that time, uh, I was, you know, when I would try out for places to preach and all that, I had to actually ask the congregation, will you please pay my expenses? Uh, they would have me to drive all over the place, fly all, all over the place, and uh, they wouldn't seem to like they wanted to reimburse me. And so it's a pretty bad situation. I thought that, you know, you have to ask them, will you reimburse me? Now, if they make arrangements up front, they tell you we're not going to reimburse you. That's one thing, and even that's not good. Uh, but when you're expecting them to reimburse you and they don't, and you got to, like, ask them, that's, that's pretty tough on a young guy trying to get a preaching job. Well, when I came here to try out, the first thing they, they told me was, uh, even before I got here, what's your plane ticket? And they sent me a check for that. And then when I got here, rent a car, they asked me, and that, that was Gordon Methvin, by the way, Uncle Gordon, or uh, Uncle, yeah, Uncle Gordon, Gordon Methvin, uh, that was the man there. I know David knows him real well, and uh, that's the kind of guy he was, and that impressed me. I was like, wow. That, and, and a young guy at that time, and I didn't have to go begging for just what should be, I would think would be understood. We're going to pay your gas. We're going to pay your plane ticket, you know. But I didn't, and that impressed me. And that's the way the school has been ever since. And before I got here, that's the way it was because of men like Gordon. And uh, that's the way we want to be. We want to continue that. So these guys, I mean, you know, I don't know how long it takes them to write. No, if I, if I have a, a manuscript from scratch, I'm going to put in probably 40 hours maybe writing that thing, research and writing that thing. Um, and so there's a lot of work. And really, a hundred dollar stipend for them speaking, because they and, and yeah, that's really that's really bare bones. That's really uh, it's almost ripping the guy off. But you know, anyway, well maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, you you know what I'm saying. We we want to do what's right with these guys. Um, it's only right if we have the opportunity, if we have the ability, and you have a lot to do with that. Our ability to do that. Uh, and again, every year, our our audience, our assembly, uh, those who support us, uh, we've. We've always broken even, as far as I can remember. Maybe, maybe some, maybe a year or two, maybe a little bit short. But uh, you all have always come through, and so we expect that this year. But I just want to encourage you to help us if you can. All right, so we will have a brief prayer uh, dinner tonight. We're on our own. Uh, Six fifteen is the congregational singing. Six forty-five, I have a little something to say about the school, and so, uh, and then seven o'clock, uh, come with your with your cup because it's going to run over uh, in the study of God's word. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Loving God and gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for the great lessons we've heard, the great uh, confidence that we have gained in your word and in our ability to ascertain truth. We thank you, Father, so much for the wisdom that you have shown in, in giving us your word the books of the Bible that you gave us, the things they teach, the things that we can learn. We thank you, Father, for the scope of the Old Testament as well as the New. And we thank you, Father, that your providence has brought it down to us that we can read and understand it in our own language. And we pray, Father, that we will continue to study and to learn and hunger and thirst for your word. Be with us now as we break. We, under, we uh, also want to pray uh, for the uh, Harp family and Richard and his health and pray that you would bless him and his family. We know we fall short of your glory and we beg your forgiveness and your strength through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.